I've been on a carnivore diet now known as the lion diet for the past three and a half years. One of my viewers told me that I have to watch this interview because it's mind blowing. You are a Stanford educated physician. Patients in America are getting much sicker. When any American gets sick with a chronic condition, they go on a lifetime medication and they keep racking up more comorbidities, but you don't die, you just suffer. We are put on the pharma treadmill from the moment we are born in this country. What is the highest value intervention you can do for a patient? Get them to eat healthy. Doesn't cost a lot, has incredible outcomes universally. But even that was corrupted by corporate interests because how the doctor had to report on quality was through these metrics called MIPS, basically, you know, merit-based incentive little criteria. And they were most of them were based on how many of their patients were medicated. So instead of a doctor having to report quality as I have a patient who got better, who got <laughs> healthier, Which we expect. it was how much of the patient population was on long-term medication. So these can, every condition I mentioned earlier in this episode and every condition she had are on this metabolic disease spectrum. So you believe, so pancreatic cancer specifically, if my memory serves, and I think it does, was kind of an unusual, it was always famously dangerous, deadly. Skyrocketing. I have noticed like all of a sudden people you know. What are the risk factors? Obesity, mm -hmm. diabetes, smoking. It is fundamentally a lifestyle disease. Pancreatic cancer. Why cancers. it is going up. So is breast cancer. Breast cancer. I mean, breast cancer is now one in eight women. You know, this is an estrogen, often an estrogen. foodborne illness. Estrogen driven cancer. Well, where are all these extra estrogens coming from? Oh, huh. Maybe it's the 6 billion pounds of pesticides that are being invisibly sprayed on all of our food and poisoning it. And what yeah. are these pesticides doing? They're estrogen receptor agonists. Interesting. Being that, sold to us. That's one of the reasons why I don't eat vegetables and I chose a carnivore way of eating. One of the things that they use to harvest wheat, which is already changed from its natural state to begin with, is Roundup, and that's not a pesticide, but it's a weed killer, and a lot of people are familiar with it. I, what's the name of that? Well, anyway, I can't think of what the drug name is right now, or the medical name for it, or whatever the the name is for Roundup. But they use that to kill the wheat. So every cereal you're eating that has a wheat product in it, every food, bread, and everything else you buy that has wheat in it, is going to have some Roundup in it, and that is affecting us. And then, like she said, the pesticides. A lot of people don't realize that they're killing a large amount of animals to raise the crops that they raise the way that they're being raised these days by killing all of the pests. They got to kill the squirrels and the smaller, uh, all the little bunny rabbits and all the cute little animals that like to come in and eat off those vegetables. They got to kill those too. They got to kill the bugs. They got to kill the worms, the caterpillars. And that stuff that's killing them is killing you too. And I'm not saying they're not using it when they feed the animals in a lot of cases that make up the diet that I eat all the time. But the one thing that's amazing about those animals is their, especially ruminants, is that they're able to separate those toxins out of their food so that the meat that they have is not intoxicated with that bad stuff. Now, I don't know if it can get all of it out. That's one of the reasons I buy local as much as I can from a rancher that I know does regenerative farming practices and he doesn't use pesticides anywhere on his property. He doesn't use herbicides of any kind. He doesn't use anything other than Redmond salt, believe it or not, for his cows and animals that come in after they leave the paddock. The pigs will come in and root around in the poop and spread it all around. And then the chickens will come in and eat, scratch around in that and, and eat all the bugs. And then about 45 days later, when the cows come back to that same paddock, they got tall, healthy grass that they can eat that's full of carbohydrates and gets them the fat that they need in their bodies without stuffing them full of corn. But I don't want that to be the reason anybody stays away from a carnivore diet because I got most of my benefit on a carnivore diet eating store-bought meat. And hopefully that will remain the case for a long period of time. So don't let store-bought meat being less expensive than local meat stop you from doing anything that's going to change your life radically for the better as far as health goes. Go ahead and get that store-bought meat if it's all you can afford. But if you can, when you can, support your local regenerative farming rancher that is raising beef and lamb and other things the right way so that you're helping support the industry that will ultimately support us to be healthier. And hopefully more and more farmers will get back to an older version of raising crops that might be able to reverse some of the problems that's in all of our, our crops that are, that are vegetables, but also getting back to uh, seasonal harvesting of fruits and things like that and not 
changing the way these fruits are made to make them sweeter. I don't know if that's going to happen, but I do know that a carnivore way of eating is going to help you fight off all of that stuff because it's done it for me and it's done it for a lot of other people. And if it has done it for you and you'd like to share your story, I encourage you to go to my website, ferrignofreedom.com and click on the link where you can choose to submit a form letting me know about your carnivore story and then I might be able to have you on my show to share your carnivore story with the world because the more people who are sharing their success stories about this crazy way of eating that we're doing called carnivore, whether you're lion diet or standard carnivore, carnivore or some version of carnivore, maybe you're just animal based. If you're getting benefits from that, I want to speak to you and I want to be able to share it with the world so that more people can find out that this can be the solution for them to break free from everything that Casey and Callie and Tucker are talking about here right now. Hey, it's Dante Ferrigno. I just wanted to thank you, first of all, for watching this video, but I also wanted to tell you about my merch shop. I have a link in the description for a bunch of different items I've put together for you to be able to show your support for the carnivore lifestyle, and every purchase helps me to keep doing what I'm doing here on Ferrigno Freedom. From China and from Germany, you know? Which they're not using in their food there. Let's go back. To Illegal. So what is that? What and what are these pesticides doing? They're estrogen receptor agonists. Interesting. Being sold to us from China and from Germany, you know? Which they're not using in their food there. Illegal. So what, is that, what does that mean? I'm, I'm sorry, does it, I just want to make sure the science is clear because I don't, I don't really understand it. It's the effects of these chemicals on food is what? So the, the ostensibly these, these chemicals are being used 6 billion pounds globally per year because of pest control. They're also being used on our children's parks and golf courses and all over the place. They're invisible, they're tasteless, and they are directly toxic to our cellular biology. So they're pesticides. Side is the word for the act of killing. So herbicides, insecticides, fungicides. And they are so toxic that 20% of all suicides globally are performed by drinking pesticides. And yet we're told by our government that they're totally safe. There's this, this one, will, <laughs> this one will shock you. Uh, but you look at, so, you know, the largest merger ever done in Germany was Bayer Monsanto, where Bayer, uh, which is a pharmaceutical company merged with Monsanto, which is an agrochemical company in the United States. Um, if you look at what uh, Bayer makes, they make cancer drugs for things like non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. If you look at what Monsanto makes, which is Roundup, which is the most widely used pesticide in America, the cancer that it uh, causes is non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. They paid out $11 billion in the past couple of years for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma cases. So the companies are merging that are directly known to cause the disease with a medical company that has a treatment for the disease. Like this is very, very dark. And yeah. um, so it, like Callie said, you know, it's kind of this revolving door uh, between create the illness, treat the illness and hide the science that tells but, us what's happening. But but this is all a result of the food industry wanting food cheaper. And we spend per capita half as much on food as, as they do in Europe. Uh, but we spend three times more per capita on healthcare. So I, my big point to everyone is this is not the free market at work. This is food companies lobbying to have neurotoxins and endocrine disrupting chemicals on our food that, it, that's, that are toxic, that aren't allowed on any other food in any other developed country in order to make food a lot cheaper. And then to your point about, you know, what does the, um, what do these Are you listening, America? Are you listening to what he's saying? It's not about the free market. It's not about capitalism. It's about people that are using what I would call cronyism to buy influence, to have the ability to put this junk on the food that we eat. They don't allow this in Europe. And apparently they don't allow it in China for their citizens. Although I don't know that for sure. I'm going based on what they said here. But I get a lot of my viewers overseas that will say, yeah, you Americans, man, you guys will eat anything. It isn't like we're choosing to do that. It's that we trusted our government to protect us from these things. That's one of the reasons why I have been fighting against using regulation to do this stuff is it's given everybody this false sense of security that this stuff is safe and it's not. When you pull up to a McDonald's and you see that test from the health department that has a score of 100 on it, a lot of people look at that and they think, oh, that means it's clean here and I'm, they're not serving bad food. 
And then you still get sick when you eat it. I mean, I remember the last time one of my kids went to a Taco Bell. It's been a while, thank God. They got sick from it and they didn't want Taco Bell anymore. Well, they had one of those tests up in the windows there that said 100 on the score. Yet they still got sick from eating the food? Something ain't right. And it's because there is a false sense of security that's given when these people are being bought off and paid off in some way or another. It's allowing us to make decisions that are skewed by things that we're supposed to be able to believe in, but we can't. And it's a shame, but it's the truth. And then to your point about, you know, what does the, um, what do these kids do? It increases estrogen. Um, and, you know, these kids are inhaling hormone disrupting chemicals. So and now- the, 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 the New York Times recently had a front page article uh, that puberty rates, uh, particularly among women in the United States, are plummeting. Uh, or, people are hitting the, puberty younger. years earlier. Younger. People, girls how, are hitting how puberty. Young? The average girl in America is getting hitting puberty, which is sexual Hell maturity, nine. six years earlier than they were in 1900. We have the earliest puberty rates of any continent in the world. It's age 10 okay. and 10 to 13. And this is in large part thought to do because of we are literally giving children estrogen with all the plastics we're ingesting, which are xenoestrogens, meaning mm. they are exogenous artificial estrogens and the pesticides, which can activate the estrogen receptors like atrazine. I mean, you can put atrazine, which is a pesticide that we spray uh, about 70 million pounds of in the US every year. It's not legal in Europe, but it's sold to us from international it's countries. It's not legal in Europe? No, you cannot use it. And you put this on a developing male frog embryo and it turns into a female frog. That's how much of an estrogen disrupting, an estrogen or an endocrine disrupting chemical that it is. That That's amazing. I've heard about the early puberty problem and it started earlier than us using a lot of these medicines, a lot of these uh, chemicals that she's talking about because the amount of sugar we're consuming also raises your insulin levels. And insulin is a hormone that not only tells your body to take blood sugar and put it into the cells to be used, it also grows your organs. It's one of the reasons why the kids are growing faster than they should be is they're insulin resistant at very young ages. And that's enhancing their rate of puberty because their organs are developing faster than they should. So this combination has become extremely deadly. And I wasn't even really focusing on this previously. So I'm learning right along with you guys as I watch this. And I hope that you're taking notes because this is serious stuff. And if we're not sharing this with our families, then shame on us because we're not watching out for those that we really love and care for. If we're letting this information go into our ears and we're not sharing it with the other people out there in the community. I'm taking a risk to put this on my channel because I know that a lot of the things they're gonna talk about are gonna get it demonetized. And me being a small channel like this, I could even lose my whole channel status. So any support you can give watching me here or on Rumble or on Odyssey or on Facebook I pre or on X, I appreciate it because it's going to be allow me to keep getting this message out so that I can afford to take care of my family while I spend all this time looking at this type of thing and putting it into small digestible bits or sharing my story with you so that you can know that there is an answer to all this stuff for your individual use, something you can put into practice now that's going to help you to get yourself better, to get your family better, but also to be able to offer this information to you to share quickly with your friends where it's not just some goofy guy like me out there that's trying something crazy like a carnivore diet, but you've got Stanford trained doctor here that's telling her story about what's going on in the medical community. And this is not the only story out there like this. There are tons others and I've shared some on my YouTube channel and there are a lot of carnivore doctors out there who are telling the truth about this, like Dr. Ken Barry and Dr. Sean Baker. And I encourage you, if you've never heard of those people, to look up their channels on YouTube and you'll get an earful of some really good information on what's going on out there that could save your children's lives, that could change your life for the better within weeks of doing it. I noticed it within days of switching to a carnivore diet that I was feeling better. And then after losing nearly 100 pounds or over 100 pounds at one point, that it changes things. And then I started exercising because I had the energy to exercise thanks to a change in the way of diet. And age 51, I feel better than I did my entire life. That 
just blows my mind because I really thought at age 48, I was already done. I'm kind of ready to check out. I feel awful. I'm tired of this stuff. I'm tired of the pain that I'm in. I'm tired of feeling fat and sick and all the things that I felt. And I know there's a lot of people out there right now that are feeling the same thing that I'm talking about that feel stupid and crazy when they talk to their doctors and their doctors can't find anything that they can fix, but they can sure prescribe a lot of medicine for you and you never seem to be getting better. This may be the answer that you've been looking for. I can't say that definitively because I don't know your individual problems. And I also have to be careful of what I say and how I say it in a public forum like this because they could take it down at any moment or they could shut me down altogether. But that's why I keep reiterating, please share this information as much as you can. Share the original video for this, which I'll have a link for in the description and share this information with your family yourself, especially as you start to see changes. Anyway, I've gone on about that too much. Let's go ahead and continue. So these chemicals are not inert. And again, because we can cherry pick science and so much of these science, I mean, these papers are PR papers paid for by industry. The Monsanto papers was a huge thing that, you know, a, a revelation, they had to declassify these documents that Monsanto had basically ghostwritten scientific papers to say that these chemicals are safe. Wait, can I just yeah. ask an obvious question? So the incidents of transgenderism or whatever we're calling it uh, have skyrocketed, thousands of percent increase in the last 10 years. And there are many threads to this. It's partly a political movement, a social movement, but you sort of wonder if it's not also a biological Absolutely. response to these chemicals. Is that I'll say, possible? I'll, I'll say this, just as a demonstrable fact, our child's environment is to an unprecedented degree full of hormone disrupting chemicals. The assault on a child's cells and hormones is unrelenting right now. Unrelenting. And their bodies are small. They can't handle it, you know? So you take a child and you put them on a screen for the average kid is using a screen seven hours a day. Okay. And so this is hitting their dopamine. So that's one input. You've got we're eating a credit card's worth of plastic per week, right? And these are hormone disrupting chemicals. All of our How food is- How are we is, eating uh, plastic in that volume? Well, the, the plastic, food. well, plastics are in everything now. They're in our air. There are nanoparticles of plastic in the air we're breathing. They're in our water. They're covering every piece of food that we buy in the grocery store. You go to Europe, all the vegetables are just, you know, they're just in these free markets, you know, they're not packaged. In the US, you go to Trader Joe's, every single piece of food is covered in plastic. That's, you've got the plastic water bottles, every single can that we drink in the United States is lined plastic with a plastic lining, coating, yeah. every single one. It's all getting in. And this can actually directly disrupt our mitochondrial function, which is the metabolic machinery of the cell. So microplastics actually can disrupt the way we make energy in the body. And we know that metabolic issues are the root cause of every chronic illness facing Americans today. You can't make this up, you know? And then you have the endo, you have the, there's many effects of these things, um, but endocrine disrupting and mitochondrial disruption are two of the really big ones. Um, then you've got the kids eating 70% of their calories that a child is eating today is from a factory, industrially manufactured, ultra processed foods. We know that these foods are destroying our cellular biology. So it's really, you know, and with school start times, kids are not getting enough sleep. So across sleep, across movement, you know, the average kid is spending less time outdoors than a prisoner in America right now. Like kids are not going outside. We're not getting the sunshine. Our circadian rhythms are destroyed. So every level of society, public school start times are disrupting our food, our nutrients, our sleep, our stress and dopamine, our movement patterns and our toxins. And we are we are getting destroyed. And this is the visible hand. And, and, and we just have to understand this when we're thinking about healthcare policy. There's nothing more profitable than a sick child, as I said, or really hijacking a kid's dopamine, right? Think about the trillions of dollars that are generated from a child's dopamine being hacked, being on that phone all day. You know, it's neither good nor bad necessarily. It's just an economic fact. There's a huge incentive for that kid to be, you know, their chronic stress to be just triggered nonstop on that phone. There's huge profit for a child to be addicted to ultra processed food and continuing to demand from their parents that food. You know, there's huge addicted, there's huge uh, incentive for a child to be sick and getting on the statins, which are doubled in prescription rates in high schools in the past 
10 years, to get on the SSRIs that are now handed out like candy in high schools, to get on the metformin, you know, to get on the Ozempic, which is now being recommended. Uh, they're pushing for six years old and up for if your child is overweight, lifetime prescription Ozempic. That's very profitable. So, so you have basically the free market at work. I think capitalism is the greatest invention in human history. But just looking agnostically at the incentives, it's as many pills as we can give that kid, as much we can keep that kid in fear, as much as we can keep that kid sick without dying right away. That's what's fueling the largest industries in the country. Most. All right, I got some leftover pot roast. I think this was sirloin tip roast that I made and I added some suet to it to have a little extra fat. So it's all, all that liquid you see, I don't know if you can see anything in there, but all of that liquid is fat. I didn't use any water when I cooked this, this roast. And I was just reheating it because I made this a couple days ago and I love it. But you know what I love even more is my wife, after three and a half years of doing this, is starting to get serious about her diet as well. And she just pulled out a pack of ribeyes I didn't even know she had put in the freezer. So I'm excited. I get to have ribeye tonight. We haven't had a lot of ribeye lately because the cost has been a little bit rough. I've been eating a lot more hamburger because I buy whole cows and I have tons of hamburger meat. So I'm excited. We're having ribeye tonight. I just ask, there's so many, uh, this could go on 10 hours. Um, let's just stop with Ozempic really quick because Ozempic, um, and you and I had a pretty remarkable conversation about Ozempic. And at the end of it, I thought, well, that's never going to be popular because that's kind of terrifying. I was wrong as usual. And now it is ubiquitous. Kids are taking it. College students are taking it. Um, as a physician, what do you, what do you, what's your, your view of Ozempic? I think it's very dark. I think it's um, it's a stranglehold on the U.S. population, almost like solidifying this idea that there is a magic pill. I mean, literally the book by Johan Ari is called Magic Pill. Uh, and convincing us that, you know, salvation from our chronic health issues is going to be found in a shot when we are living in a toxic stew that's destroying our cellular biology. You know, it's, of course, for certain patients, taking GLP-1 agonist is going to be helpful for their conditions. It might jumpstart their their way to getting is, back to is health. Is that the name of the, the active drug? In GLP-1 it? agonist. Yeah. So GLP-1. <laughs> Sorry, is, not not fluent in this. No, no. It's, it's That's what the medications are. And so they're basically s simulating a hormone that's made in our digestive system that cues satiety and does many other things. And so, Q's you know, satiety is making us make feel, you feel full, full. Yeah. making us, you know, and, and what's so interesting, you know, like we are, the, like Callie said earlier, like we are the only species in the world that has an obesity and chronic disease epidemic. The only species in the world that has a chronic disease and obesity epidemic because of ultra processed food. You think about every other animal in the wild, they're eating real natural foods, except for domesticated animals, which are also getting chronic diseases, just like humans, because they're eating our food. But every other animal, they're able to regulate their satiety. They're not eating themselves to death like we are. We're literally eating ourselves to death. The reason is because these foods, like Callie talked about with the cigarette companies and the scientists moving to create addictive ultra processed foods, they are designed to subvert our satiety mechanisms like GLP-1 secretion, so that we never know that we're full. But if we were eating whole real food, we would cue the exquisite satiety mechanisms in our bodies and we would not overeat. If you're if you're eating real, whole, unprocessed, nutrient-rich foods, we have receptors in our gut that make us feel full. It's you, not you rocket science. You almost can't. If you eat just protein, um, which is hard. You can't overeat. You cannot overeat. No, that's you right. You can't eat too much steak. It's not even yeah. possible. And think about this. You know, it's incredible. If you can convince people that, that, that this is not true, you know, and defy the entire animal kingdom, what's happening with other animal, <laughs> this could be on track to be the most profitable medication ever in human history. It will be if if the powers that be let it. And what it, the unfortunate part is that it doesn't take our bodies out of the toxic stew that's crushing our biology. Yes, we may melt some fat, but we're really, we're essentially creating starvation to melt fat and muscle without changing any of the other levers that we just talked about that are crushing our biology. So I, this is not the public health. Well, after some technical issues that arose after that interruption, I'm back. Uh, it's another day, actually. I had to finish it afterward because everything was a mess. But anyway, let's just continue on. I've backed it up a couple of words so we can pick up right where we left off.
I, this is not the public health solution. You look at what's happening, though. Do you think there are potential downsides to it? I mean, there's every medication has downsides. And this one has well-known side effects. It disproportionately causes us to lose muscle mass, which creates frailty, which is one of the things that can cause old people in old age to have very poor quality of life and early death. It has a higher rate of thyroid cancer. It has risks on the label of kidney dysfunction, of pancreatitis, of all sorts of things. Every medication has side effects. So if we're going to mass prescribe this, so there's a bill right now in Congress, H.R. 4818, which is the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act. And, you know, you look at this and you think, oh, this is great. The government's focusing more on obesity and this is awesome. There's one line that all that matters in that, which is that they want to expand Medicare access to include coverage for these medi for obesity medications, which are these drugs, for people that include overweight and obese. That is 74% of the American population. If this bill goes through and everyone who is eligible for this drug gets it paid by taxpayers, that will represent over $3 trillion per year in drugs to the American people without changing any of the root causes of what is making us sick. And to add insult to injury, this will be taxpayer money being largely funneled to Europe who makes the drug. So people need Which to Which they don't prescribe. Up. And it's, it's 10 times less expensive and it's not the standard of care. And it's not so much that it's Europe. It's the fact that when, when government does this kind of thing, they make it look like it's for you. But what they're actually doing is rewarding somebody who is paying their bills. They're rewarding somebody who financed their campaign or gave them some money under the table or is allowing them to have inside information. These are the things we know that go on. It's not like I'm saying anything new here. It's just when you hear it put together like this and you realize that's exactly what the bill is meant to do is to repay the people that are paying them, it has nothing to do with public health. It has nothing to do with getting people healthy. They can virtue signal that that's what they're trying to do. And they can claim that that's what they did, but it has nothing to do with that at all. It's all about corruption. It's cronyism at its best. That's exactly what I was talking about earlier. In, in Norway, when you are obese, there's Is that where it's made? Yeah. Um, Nova Nordisk. Yeah, there's a step ladder and, and you get the keto diet and exercise incentivized from the government. Um, in the country that makes us epic. And yeah. the American oh, yeah. Academy of Pediatrics in their most recent obesity guidelines are recommending these drugs for kids as young as 12. And pushing for six. This is a lifelong medication at the cost of about $1,500 a month with many side effects that does not cause, that does not change any of the root causes issues that are toxifying, literally destroying our brains and bodies. Can I, can I ask, I mean... I, uh, as you've said three times, and I hope you'll say it three more, every drug has side effects. But they seem intentionally downplayed in a lot of cases. Doctors don't seem to want to talk about the potential side effects. Why is that? Because mm. if you have an obese patient- it's weird. Okay, so let me just paint the picture. They're pushing for six, obese or overweight. Six years old. Yeah. So we have obviously an obese, Real quick, before he gets into his explanation of what Tucker's asking about is why is it downplayed? Why is it uh, not looked at at all? That has more to do with what I was talking about earlier, where I say that we are we have a false sense of security. So that even when we hear the commercial, which is probably more than 50% a list of side effects, and they say all those side effects during the commercial, we just, we don't hear those things because we assume that, hey, it's it's a new drug that they came out with. Of course, it's going to have side effects. I'm not worried if it's going to leave me bleeding from my eyes and dead and all the other things that they mention on there. All you hear is easy solution to my problem. That's not going to require me to change my lifestyle. I want to try that. And that's that's the sad part is that we're not taking control of our own health situation. We're trusting somebody else. We put our faith in the hands of people who are looking to profit off of your illness. And until you realize that's the case and that you've got to take control of it through your own lifestyle changes, it's just going to keep happening. And that's why influencers like me are going to be attacked by those companies and by those legislators because they don't want you getting free of their control mechanisms. They want you under that control so that they can keep profiting, keep getting reelected, keep having power, keep having money. 
It's just, it's the way of the world. Might as well face that. But you can break free from it. You've just got to decide you're ready to get off the merry-go-round. That's what I think. Anyway, let's go ahead and hear what he had to say. They're pushing for six. Obese or overweight. Six years old. Yeah. So we have obviously an obesity crisis among six-year-olds right now in the country. In Japan, the childhood obesity rate is 3%. In the United States... 50% this is uniquely of teens, American. 50 of yeah. teens are overweight or obese. So let's just look at that, right? We're clearly just force feeding into our children toxic food that's causing this massive issue. And now any parent watching, particularly lower income, because this bill is pushing for Medicaid. So if you're a lower income, so why are they lobbying? Why is this, why is this company in Scandinavia one of the five largest lobbying spenders in America and pushing so hard for this? And why is the stock so high and it's the 12th most valuable company in the world? They're expecting 80 to 90% of their profits from the United States from the government by rigging the institution. What institution are pharma companies rigging? They're actually rigging Medicaid. They're actually profiting off poor people. Medicaid is spending more on mitochondrial dysfunction than the entire U.S. defense budget and growing much faster, right? This is a- Mito They're profiting off of anybody who pays taxes because the taxpayers pay for Medicaid also. So they're profiting off of poor people in the sense that they feed them the garbage food. And that's the really bad thing that's happening to poor people is that they're being led to the slaughter with their health and they're trusting the government to help them. And then they use their, their Medicaid to get the help that actually doesn't help anything. And it's like this vicious circle. And it's it's sickening to see because it's it's evil. I mean, that's all there is to it is it's evil. And they go around talking about all the good they're doing for the poor. That's the thing that gets me. And so few people see that. I get so much pushback on these things when I talk about why government is the problem. Government is the problem for exactly the reason we're seeing here. The American taxpayer is being fleeced for the money to send to these companies that are paying the bills of the political class, paying the bills of everybody in the news. And heck, they're probably even paying some of my bills if there's any commercial showing up on this video, which there may not be if it gets demonetized. But you see, I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to put the money that I would make on this on the line because I'm interested in telling you the truth. And I'm counting on that to be all I need to support me is that I'm doing the right thing. I believe that that's what's required. And I think if more people started doing the right thing, especially people in public office, it would help us out a lot. There's so much hair blowing around in here from Sam when I was scratching him just now, his fur on this tile floor in here, I swear it'll, we call them sample weeds because it's little balls of Sam's hair just blowing across the floor. We could vacuum every day. And I vacuum cleaner, I could fill up an entire dog's worth of hair in there after two days of vacuuming. And then he'll come back and just do the same thing again right after that. So funny. Anyway, let's get back to this serious business. Mitochondrial uh, various metabolic metabolic issues, issues this tied core to cellular dysfunction. diabetes. We're we're spending on on Medicaid more on preventable metabolic chronic conditions than the defense budget, and Medicaid's one of the fastest growing items in the uh, in the budget. That's all rigged by pharma as a piggy bank. So this bill, if you put Ozempic on that schedule, then any lower income six year old. The doctor can say, I've got Harvard studies here saying that obesity is genetic. It's not your child's fault. Let's get them a lifetime jabs. Well, if it's genetic, why didn't it exist 100 years ago? Good question. But Harvard and the NIH and the American Academy of Pediatrics is saying it's a brain disease. It's genetic. And on 60 Minutes, as we talked about, a leading Harvard physician, Fatima Cody Stanford, said that it's a, that uh, throw willpower out the window. This is a genetic condition. And it's actually... She said, uh, an affront and classist and racist to suggest it's anything other than genetic. So that's the message being told from medical system. You ask why? Because the second you can get that six-year-old on a lifetime injection, and let's just take this to every drug, it's the chronic disease treadmill. They're told that injection is a savior, right? And then the government, it's the largest line item in our budget. It's going to bankrupt the country. It's growing faster than any other line item in the budget, Right. And Medicaid, the government is going to pay for that lower income kid $1,500 a month because the government also has to just pay the sticker price, right? We're paying our sticker price is 10 times more expensive than Germany. 
So, 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 so the second you get something on the Medicaid schedule, then all lower income people are open season. And what's so criminal about this and what so representative of why this is a problem is that the medical system is saying, they're saying it's a social justice issue. It's a moral issue. We have to pay $1,500 for 74% of US adults who are overweight or obese per month. That we have to, we have to find the money. The stock is the 12th most valuable company in the world at expectation that the U.S. is going to say that. But where is that urgency from the medical system about why this stuff is happening in the first place, why it's not happening in Japan? Where's the urgency on saying, hey, parents, maybe we shouldn't feed our kids toxic food. Maybe we should be looking at the root cause of obesity. And so this is the key point. Forget There's too much money being made by everybody at every step of this process, except for the American taxpayer. That's the problem. And I'm sure it's going on in other countries too. People are being fleeced everywhere we look. The governments are just destroying us with the way that they're leading us down this primrose path. They're using all of these socialist mentality panaceas to let us know that we're going to have everything we want as long as we trust them. And this is the actual result, is it's just destroying us as a people across the board, anybody who falls into this. Look at any country that falls into socialism, exactly what happens. Venezuela, the former Soviet Union. I mean, people wind up starving in the streets. That's The, the elites are fine with that. The World Economic Forum, they're fine with that because they know they're going to have plenty. And that's what makes it so nefarious. And that's why we've got to take control of our own situation and stop trusting the government. Any public policy, the medical leadership should just say the truth. They should explain why there's an obesity crisis among children. It's not a ozempic deficiency. It's because of very <laughs> simple inputs to our metabolic environment and frankly, a rig system where our food has been compromised. There's it, nothing conservative or liberal about our food system being compromised. Oh, I couldn't agree more. It's not- the, the medical system before any public policy should simply state that. And a key point in America- is that we listen to our medical leaders. We changed our diet when the food pyramid came out. We, smoking rates plummeted when the Surgeon General the report came out. majority of Americans got the COVID vaccine. When Dr. Yeah. Fauci said, get the vax, most people, we respect and listen, but medical providers, they actually literally have social justice components where they're, they're actually uh, not able to recommend uh, natural food because there's a component in the USDA nutrition guidelines which takes into account social justice. So they're worried about affordability. May, may, may I ask, what, what does that mean? So it's, it's racist to eat non-poisonous food? In, in America, it is classist and racist to suggest that mothers shouldn't be poisoning their kids. Yes, th that, that is what the USDA argues. So it seems like yet another example, there are so many of them, and you've talked right. about them when you were lobbying for Coke, of the richest people in the society, the ones who are looting the society, using issues like racism or sexism or classism as cudgels to beat back criticism of their looting. Right. The NAACP is a registered it's lobbyist for Ozempic <laughs> today. There are the part that makes there us are, scratch our head is like, how is it, how can we, how are we so delusional that we think it is easier to inject a child weekly for life than find a way to get that child healthy food? Delusional is the right word. That, that is exactly what it is. I think it's delusional that they don't think we don't see this, but there's so many people who don't. That's why I keep talking about it. That's why I keep sharing this information. We have to take things into our own hands as far as our health goes. That has changed my life like nothing else. And that's one of the reasons why I'm doing this as a carnivore influencer, which, you know, I didn't start this to be a carnivore influencer. I just started this because I was doing YouTube with a gaming thing with my son. And then I thought, you know what? I'm going to lose some weight doing this low carb thing that I'm going to be doing when I start lion diet. I knew I was going to lose weight because I'd seen what happened on Atkins diet before. And I thought, well, this is even more extreme than Atkins. So I'm certainly going to lose some weight. And I figured I'll make a video and share that so my friends would know about it. But ever since then, this has become a mission for me. This has become a calling because it's changed my life so dramatically. I'm no longer on this slave ride of uh, it, the medical care system and the food system. When I go to the grocery store, I'm in and out. I pick up some meat. I'm out the door. Things aren't perfect. There's plastic on the meat. There's plastic in the, the bottles of water that I buy. Even if I get a water filtration system, that's going to have plastic in it. So, I mean, it's you can only limit so much. But just doing that has changed things dramatically for me. 
Yes, I've been able to add regenerative meat to my diet. It's more than 50% of my diet is still store-bought meat though. So, I mean, my point is, is that I'm still having healthcare changes in my life. I hardly ever get sick. I don't have high blood pressure anymore. I don't have any of the problems that I used to need all kind of medications for as a result of sticking to a carnivore way of eating. I feel better than I have my entire life. I'm 51 years old. I'm about to be 52 in a couple of months. And I feel better than I did when I was in high school on the wrestling team getting in shape for wrestling. So that's why I keep coming back is I want to be able to offer a solution to people who are caught on the same merry-go-round that they're talking about because I can't change what they're doing at the government level. All I get is one vote. And as I was reminded when I was voting this past Tuesday in the primaries here in Florida, we're still using an electronic voting system that I have very little faith in. Very little faith in. I, to be honest, I don't have any faith in it. But it's like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I mean, I'm, I, as a citizen, I'm still going to vote. Even though I don't like seeing what's happening and I don't have any faith in it, I'm still going to do it. And I encourage you to do it too. Because as a people, we've still got to do the right thing. And I think that's the thing that's going to save us all, is that we've got to start at this level. I can't fix what they're doing in Washington myself, but I can fix what's going on in my body and in my mind so that I can be the best I can for my wife and my kids, which means they can be the best they can be with my support. And that's going to spread to the community. And if more people are doing that and waking up to the realities of the things we're learning here, then we will be able to turn the system around. You know, something the founders used to talk about in the United States early phases was there's no laws that we can write down that are going to secure anything for us as far as freedom goes if there is no virtue in the people. We've got to take responsibility for our own lives and our own decisions if we're going to turn this mess around and stop trusting people who don't do anything but hand us lies and platitudes to get us to vote for them or to use our free insurance, our government-supported health care to get these products. It's, it's all just a funnel of money and power going to one small group, and it's all coming out of our pockets and out of our lives. That power is gone. That money is gone. And our health is suffering for it, too. You got to take control on your own. Like we, that is that is a track that we're on right now. That is as that is insane. But we're believing it. We're drinking that Kool Aid. It doesn't make any sense. We could take these dollars so simply, so easily, and funnel them towards healthier diet and lifestyle. Three trillion dollars a year. We could, we could feed every country, every single American family with organic food for three trillion dollars a year. But instead, we're we're taking those healthcare dollars and steering them towards drugs, which doesn't fix the root cause issue. Our message isn't drug or anti-drug. It's just like let's look at the problem. Like say say you're just an alien that came down from space. You look at America. Kids and adults are just overwhelmingly metabolic, dysfunctional, obese, diabetic. It's like you'd never say, like, let's keep have this keep happening and then jab everyone and drug everyone and manage the good. It was just never, it's just follow the science. Maybe drugs actually do come into play there. But the history of chronic disease medications has been a complete disaster. We always say, if you have a gunshot wound, uh, uh, an emergency surgical need that's going to kill you right away, infection. complicated childbirth, infection, 100%. The, the medical system is a miracle. Acute issues. Chronic disease medications didn't exist before 1960. The first one was the birth control pill, the first pill that you took for more than a couple of weeks that didn't cure the issue Ever. right away. Ever. So in 1960, 0% of the medical budget work? was on chronic conditions. Well, we can talk about that. But 90, 0% was chronic conditions. Today, 95% of spending is on chronic conditions because what the, the system realized is that they can take the trust engendered after World War II with antibiotics and various medical innovations that helped win that war and then steer it towards chronic conditions. So by the 1970s, 30% of women in the United States were on Valium, a highly addictive drug. Physi Valium. Physically addictive. Yeah. And, uh, and, and and it's just been a battle to shift the medical system to chronic disease. Can we just go to the pill really quick? All right, that's where I want to stop because he's switching over to the pill, which is the next section that they want to talk about. And that's what I want to cover in the next video because we've covered a lot here. Now, the thing that they're saying there at the end that I do want to clarify that $3 trillion that they're talking about is, is already being planned to be allocated toward these drugs for people. That's money the government is spending that belongs to the American taxpayer that is already in debt over $30 trillion. I don't know what the debt's at anymore. It's like it's no sense in even keeping up with it. It's so high. But the point is, is that we've got to stop it being funneled to Washington. And to start that, 
you're going to have to get healthy. You're going to have to get off that merry-go-round that they've got you on because otherwise you're just, you're totally dependent on it. The chronic disease issue is exactly what the problem is. It's the acute medical care needs that we have that are what force us to still want to hold on to the medical community. The medical community should be there to patch you up after a car accident or anything else that happens that, boom, you got hit by something hard that you need to get some medicine or mostly surgery for. We, we definitely want that. But what we've got right now is focused so much on chronic care, problems that we didn't have 100 years ago. We've got to focus on root cause. And root cause is going to go to diet more than anything else. And if you want to fix that root cause in your life, I'm telling you right now, a carnivore way of living has done that for me. So I encourage you to check out other videos on my channel where I've talked about my journey on this way of eating. I still do it every day. I just had some shoulder roast before I came in here to start finishing this. I had some hamburger meat this morning. I don't miss all the things I used to have in my diet. I love life. I love the way my body feels. I love the way my mind feels. I love the way I'm able to go to the grocery store and not feel like I'm a slave to all these things that want my attention in there. All these advertisements on TV that used to get my attention for the McRib and for the Frosty that was at Wendy's and whatever else they wanted to advertise, they have no power over me anymore. You can break free from that stuff, but it's going to take a serious lifestyle change in the way you eat. So that's my thoughts on that one. We'll come back and check out the rest of this on another video. I appreciate you being here. I'll see you next time. If we pay extra, could we maybe get some grease or fat? The carnivore bar compared to movie theater snack prices? It's no competition. With a tub of popcorn running you over $14, I'd much rather enjoy the salty, crunchy, meaty goodness of a carnivore bar any day. And I don't have to cheat to enjoy my night out. Carnivore bar. Save 10 to 20% when you use my link in the description of this video.